is absolutely gorgeous, so it's a real treat to be able to perform, you know, in such an environment. It's not the biggest theater we go to, but it is definitely one of the most welcoming and one of the nicest. The Coleman Theater has graced the city of Miami, Oklahoma since 1929. This magnificent theater, built by George Coleman, is one of the most impressive icons on historic Route 66. The settlement of Miami, Oklahoma, unlike the wild race for land during the Oklahoma land rush, was carefully planned and carried out. One of the Indian tribes owned the land and they had a form, they formed a company up in Columbus, Kansas called the Miami Township Company and they had to go to Congress to get the land which was Indian tribal land where they could sell it. And that happened in 1891 and they started selling lots in that time. Uh, a side story to that night, there was a telegram that George Coleman Sr. got from his brother Al Coleman in Colorado saying that they were there when the first lots were, were uh, auctioned off in Miami, and they were well diggers. With a population of 800 people in 1895, the city of Miami was incorporated and became something of a trading and agricultural center. In 1905, George and Alfred Coleman discovered lead and zinc while drilling a water well just north of Miami. The two Coleman brothers did water wells, dug water wells, and they moved here and they went to work for an Indian man named Splitlog. Um, and uh, they worked for him and he, I think, maybe helped them buy their first rig for digging water wells. And they um, did water wells, but they kept hitting um, this kind of shiny, stuff and I'm not sure in the beginning if they knew what it was of course it was fool's gold in one of the stories I read about the Coleman family said that one of the they drilled one well and the shiny stuff washed out across the road and when they left that night they they threw dirt up over it because they didn't want everybody seeing it they didn't know what it was and um, but then soon found out that it was important um, lead and zinc the discovery made millionaires of the two brothers and their partners, Charles Harvey and James Robinson. Well, George Coleman and his brother Alfred came to this part of the country to dig water wells, discovered lead and zinc mines, and became very, very wealthy. Um, reports tell us he made more than a million dollars a month during the 1920s. He loved theater and had a couple of small theaters in Miami, but as a gift to the community, he built this grand theater and brought great acts for the enjoyment of the people who lived here. George Coleman did a lot of traveling, both for business and pleasure. He particularly enjoyed the vaudeville shows he saw in cities like Chicago and New York. The Orpheum vaudeville circuit had big stars and famous acts, and no one enjoyed a good show more than George Coleman. Someone in his family told me he said one time that, that his, his miners, the people who were working for him, would not ever get to see famous stage people. They wouldn't get to see ballet, they wouldn't get to see uh, opera or famous singers, or they wouldn't get to see famous people like the Marx Brothers. And by gosh, he was just going to bring them here. Early in 1928, Mr. Coleman returned to Miami with a contract for a senior Orpheum Circuit vaudeville show to open in April of 1929. The only hitch was, Miami didn't have a theater big enough or grand enough to host the best the Orpheum circuit had to offer. With less than a year to opening night, Mr. Coleman turned to the Bowler Brothers of Kansas City, Missouri to design his magnificent theater. The building is, is, is a structural steel building which most people don't realize and it's very, very strong. For instance, what they were concerned about the balcony, the balcony is a cantilevered uh, system that is really very strong. And if you look in the basement where all the, <clears throat> the pillars are, they're very smooth and after 75 years, they're still very strong. 
To cool the theater in the sultry Oklahoma summers, Mr. Coleman had installed a state-of-the-art air conditioner and heating system. With money being no object, Mr. Coleman added his own touches. The Spanish Revival exterior was not in the original plans. The citizens of Miami had never seen anything like the Coleman Theater. Mr. Coleman also spared no expense on the design of the stage. The state of the art for its time, the Coleman boasted a full fly floor for changing scenery with a complete counterweight system. A state of the art dimmer board with magnetic controls. And no movie palace in the 1920s was complete without a Wurlitzer pipe organ to accompany silent movies and vaudeville shows. Mr. Coleman was involved with every step of the construction of his theater. When the chairs were being installed, Mr. Coleman sat in one of the completed rows to find that the seats were too close to accommodate his six foot two inch frame. He ordered all of the seats removed and spaced farther apart for more comfort. In spite of a seemingly impossible deadline, the Coleman Theater was completed in 330 days. Christened Coleman Theater Beautiful, it inspired all from the patrons who attended the opening program on April 18, 1929. The Coleman Theater Beautiful brought a whole new world to the people of Miami, Oklahoma. Opening night, the Coleman's first show featured a Fox Movie Tone newsreel. Popular recording artist Gene Austin singing, She's Funny That Way. A feature movie, The Dummy, and the Coleman Theater Orchestra. The main attraction was five big acts from the senior Orpheum vaudeville circuit. Vaudeville was the most popular form of live entertainment in its heyday. Several major circuits were established, comprised of chains of theaters throughout the United States, presenting acts from singers to animal acts to puppeteers and comedy skits. Great acts that appeared here at the Coleman Theater included the Marx Brothers, of course, Will Rogers, Sally Rand and her fan dance. She was here twice, but the story is she never revealed flesh. She wore a flesh-colored bodysuit. The building of a theater of this magnitude in 1929 was ill-timed. While vaudeville and burlesque still enjoyed some popularity, silent movies had become the latest rage. But the introduction of the first talking movie ensured that the days of silent movies were numbered. Even more unfortunate was the stock market crash that led to the Great Depression. As the Great Depression of the 30s continued, vaudeville faded from the stage. Despite the inauspicious circumstances, 
From that opening night, the Coleman Theater has never been dark. Movies were becoming more popular, but the depression kept people at home. To attract more customers, the Coleman began offering cash and prizes on Wednesday nights. And they gave away dishes, a refrigerator, so everybody came bank night. It cost a dime, I think, to get in at that time. And you had to be present to win. And they say when it, they got up to $100 or something like this, the house was full on Wednesday night. 1,600 seats were full uh, because $100 in the middle of the Depression was an enormous fortune. The theater remained Mr. Coleman's favorite activity until his death in 1945. In the decades that followed, the Coleman remained at the heart of Miami. We used to sit across the street and um, Charles Banks Wilson Studios were, were was above uh, that building and we used to sit over there. There was a little long bench alongside that building and we'd look at the Coleman and uh, spend a little time looking at it. We'd pretend it was a castle or our home or, or um, we used to pretend all kinds of things. We were having a dinner party and the king was about to arrive. And um, I think all the kids in town, they had a lot of um, Christmas parties here and it just represented uh, good things for us. My first experience in the Coleman Theater was when I was 12 years old. I was here with my father. We were living at that time outside of Owasso, Oklahoma, and he was doing a state survey for the state of Oklahoma. And we happened to stay in the old Cherokee Motel up the street, and we decided to come to a movie here that night. And we sat in the very back row on the center aisle, and uh, I still remember what the film was about. I can't remember the title, but uh, there were guys on snow skis, skis uh, going through Alaska trying to chase the Russians out and the, the bad guy was about to get away when he fell to his death over a cliff and everything ended up okay. So that was my first experience with the theater. Throughout the 50s and 60s, the Coleman was still used for local dance recitals and the occasional live variety show. High schools used the Coleman for graduation ceremonies, music concerts and plays, but the Coleman was primarily a movie theater. Single screen theaters like the Coleman were hard to fill in the 70s and 80s. And at that point they had thought of at one time making this a two screen theater. The balcony would be, have a screen of its own, lower floor would have a screen of its own. And they found that that was not going to be economically sound, is the way I understood it and that it was getting ready to be sold and uh, not to be th a theater anymore. So when the theater, when it looked like the theater might be, uh, they talking about tearing it down, or a group of people just said, no, you just can't. I mean, it's, it's in everybody's life. It's part of everybody who lives here's life. In 1986, we had a meeting of our downtown people and, and they suggested that we ask the Coleman family to uh, redo the theater. The, uh, I was appointed the person to call and ask the, the family if they would do that and, and they said at the time no they wouldn't do it but they would consider giving it to our community. In 1989 the Coleman family donated the theater to the city of Miami. Uh, the theater was in very sad shape. The roof was leaking, the paint was peeling, the mighty Wurlitzer had been sold, the grand 2,000 pound chandelier had disappeared, and the stained glass panels were gone, the marquee was gone. Some in Miami felt the gift of the Coleman was a boondoggle, but there were those who felt the Coleman was worth saving. We had a, we had a night of nostalgia, <clears throat> and we had about, we had 800 seats, that we had in the, in the theater, and we gave away 800 tickets. And we set the city council down in the middle of the room. And uh, we had uh, contests about memories of the theater. We had people that sang, we had, you know, just a program. <clears throat> and then we also asked if people wanted to have the building redone. And uh, that's the way it happened. 
The labor of love involved in restoring the Coleman came not only from the city, but also from the citizens. I would have to say from the very beginning that this job could not have, be, have been done and at the stage we are now in without the volunteers. And you never know where those volunteers are going to come from. In 1992, the Friends of the Coleman was formed to restore the theater. You keep thinking as, as a volunteer you, when you came in here, you think, oh, what have we done? We will never in our lifetime finish this. Because you're not home, you paint a bedroom a couple of days. In here, I mean, look around, folks. This is lots of painting and lots of cleaning, but it, it has come along and you just kind of tackle one little section at a time. Well, we removed six tons of trash and debris from the dressing rooms and throughout the theater. Uh, just areas that had not been used were, were filled with uh, storage and so on. So a great deal of work had to be done. The gold leaf was gone. The seats were worn out. Uh, in fact, we said, if you want a spring in your seat, come sit in one of ours and you're sure to get one. So there was a great deal of work to be done, estimated at between eight and nine million dollars. A huge task, um, but the friends decided that it's sort of like eating an elephant, you just do it one bite at a time, and, and they set about uh, doing phase one, phase two, and phase three of the restoration project. And over the last 16 years, we've accomplished quite a lot. One of the missing treasures was a mighty Wurlitzer organ that had been here since it came from the factory. No one knew what happened to it. It had been sold. It was actually sold twice, once to Billy James Hargis, the television evangelist, and then there was a big search to find out what happened to it after that. Finally, it was discovered in a warehouse in Burleson, Texas, owned by a Mr. Jim Peterson, who was persuaded to sell it back to us, provided he could restore it, and we raised $100,000, had Jim Peterson bring it back. Uh, people in the community came out and carried those pipes in from the tiniest pipe to pipes taller than any of us. And one of our volunteers at that time was in his 80s, and he came and he said, I just want to help carry in part of the organ. And he was pretty feeble, but when the, we went out to the alley and they put the little pipes of the organ on his fingers and he carried in 10 pipes and put them on the stage. And there was, there was, the stage was covered with organ pipes. Uh, it's hard for people to believe because they're all up in the two side panels that there were that many, but they completely covered the stage side to side, front to back. But he carried in his part and pulled them off his fingers and, and put them down. The mighty Wurlitzer, installed when the Coleman was built in 1929, has a massive French-style mahogany console. The pipes are housed in two bays beside the stage and provide a full range of sounds. Well, the idea of a Wurlitzer organ, in particular the one here at the Coleman Theater, is the idea of replacing the orchestra to make the sounds to the equivalent of the orchestra that would play for the films. So that when you go up and look at the organ, you'll see that there's a lot of switches that enable you to play violins and uh, cellos, and you can play flutes and trumpets, tubas, oboes, uh, clarinet, and then of course you can play all the percussion devices that are so important for sound effects. So an organ like this has bird whistles and car horns and uh, the full range of uh, percussion devices like uh, tambourines and, and woodblocks and snare drum and bass drum and cymbals and so it's essentially it's a one-man orchestra and that's the whole concept of it. So the range is virtually identical to that of an orchestra. With the mighty Wurlitzer back home at the Coleman, the silent movie comes back to life. That's one of the best things about the idea of silent film revival in movie palaces. It's one of the few cultural forms of the past that when presented in the present can be presented in every detail to the point that it's time travel. I mean, we're, we're sitting in an actual restored auditorium that was exactly the way it was in the 20s. We have a print of the movie that's the same print that was shown in 1926. We have the 
organ that's the same sound, it makes the same sounds it made in 1926, and then I'm a historical preservationist, and so my performance of the score is intact and original. And so when the lights go down, there's no difference. This is 1926. I always like to say that when they restore the theater, they also have to restore the organ to give it its voice. These were the voice of the theater. The citizens of Miami demonstrated their commitment to the Coleman once more when it came time to replace the seats. Well, one of the things that was causing us a great deal of concern with continuing programs was the poor condition of the seats which had been replaced in the 60s. They were modern, they were not the beautiful originals. They were very, very worn out and uncomfortable. People often had to change seats two or three times to find one they could tolerate. Uh, but we knew we couldn't afford it. So we found the company that made the original seats and they had the design of the original seats. And we were very happy about that, but we didn't know how we could pay for it. Finally, we decided to take a big leap to actually borrow money and to try to pay those payments by having people adopt seats and put their names on those seats. This has been a phenomenally successful project. It surprised this national seating company who had never seen a theater in the whole country be as successful with seat adoptions as we have been. There's a story in all the seats and there is, there's whole families here or it says uh, to my mother, who was a teacher, and um, or the classes bought the class. Our class bought several seats. When um, when I was a teenager, we came here as um, um, Good Friday services when we were seniors, juniors, and seniors, and um, we came here to Good Friday services. And um, I was had had had. Um, uh, a few dates and was what they call going steady. And now I see fourth and fifth graders say I'm a teacher and used to be a teacher and they used to say we're going steady and I'd always go, I don't think so. But in high school we were going steady and um, the, the young man that uh, I was going with was about six rows ahead of me. And uh, you couldn't turn around or anything, but, but I saw him raise his hand in the air and kind of do his thumb in the air and I thought, what is he doing? And then a note came back, and it came back six rows to me, and um, and it said, um, um, "You're a good old girl, and secretly I'm in love with you, and will you marry me?" And um, and so I wrote yes on the bottom of it, and started it back, and it went six rows back down. And then, of course, he couldn't turn around, but I just saw he went. So I guess that. That was, we were engaged in the theater. We bought a seat in his honor back when we were selling seats and, my, and mine is, is next to his. My husband's seats says, will you marry me? And mine says, yes. Due to the nearly 20 year effort of the Friends of the Coleman, the Coleman has been restored to its former grandeur. It's very, very beautiful today. The silk panels on the walls are those original silk panels. They're not in the greatest of shape, but they're still quite beautiful. The curtains on the stage are mostly original curtains. They're very beautiful, and they're a source of pride for us, although they're a little tattered. Um, the, uh, the stained glass panels underneath the balcony, which had been sold uh, by the movie company, were all brought back and given to the theater, so those are original as well. Just in the last couple of years, we've been able to paint the ceiling for the first time since 1929 and to restore the gold leaf on the arches and underneath the balcony. We do have many, many tourists that come through here in the course of the year. Uh, Highway 66, uh, of which the Coleman Theater is a part, uh, has become one of the world's foremost tourist destinations. And uh, the theater, uh, located pretty much in the center of the distance between Chicago and Los Angeles, 
has become sort of the, um, the jeweled pendant in the necklace of Highway 66, as we like to say. Five minutes to curtain, five minutes. From silent movie night to stage and ballet productions and special events, the Coleman is still at the heart of Miami. Laces, everybody, it's showtime. <laughs> Everything we do in the theater is an act of love. Our labor is, is the labor of love, uh, particularly with the chandelier, which is so close to the hearts of the people of Miami. After an absence of 43 years, when it was put back, there just wasn't a dry eye in the house. Uh, people remember this fabulous chandelier uh, from their younger days when it would turn red, blue, and yellow and be a big light show before every movie. So it is a, is a precious treasure of our theater, and we lovingly clean it and replace all the light bulbs every two years. The chandelier was taken down in the early 60s because it, uh, it does weigh 2,000 pounds, and it become dangerous because the cable was frayed. My grandfather took it, yeah, my grandfather was, was who they hired to take it down, and they built scaffold to take it down. Although there was a hoist available, the cable was damaged, so, so they built a wooden scaffold to take it down. For a while, it was in the basement of the theater, and the glass became broken, the crystals were taken as souvenirs, and then no one knew what happened to it. It was not until the 90s that it was discovered in a horse stable on the Coleman property. Well, it had been stored apparently under hay in the water for years. It had probably been moved a couple of times. By the time it got to here, it was completely disassembled. It had no crystal, it had no glass, it had very little of the wiring left, and in fact, it had a lot of this brass was damaged. So it was, it was damaged and rusted and, and it was in a really, really sad shape. There was enough wiring intact, just enough to figure out which bulbs were yellow, which were blue, and which were red, and how the circuitry was arranged. But it was, uh, it was in pretty sad shape when we found it. The fixture was disassembled and, and damaged, so we had no glass, no patterns, no way of knowing what it was other than our photographs. So lucky for us, the Bowler Brothers, Bowler Brothers that built this building built 15 other theaters, and there's one in Columbia, Missouri who has another fixture like this. So we were able to use their chandelier to get the information that we needed, and then eventually found someone that has a kiln big enough to slump glass this size, because the glass is textured on the back, and then it's slumped, and it's also acid-edged. But uh, 
it's, every piece is made to fit this fixture only because this fixture is 75 years old. So it's kind of a one, one of a thing, one, one of a kind thing. replica. The original ball at the bottom of the chandelier was lost over the years, as were all the crystals. In fact, uh, these crystals were all purchased with aluminum can sales. The children in the elementary school saved aluminum cans to buy every one of the crystals on the chandelier that we replaced. So everybody has a part of it. interesting that your father took this down and now you're involved with the restoration. How does that make you feel? Well, oddly enough, I learned about it during the restoration as well. So it, uh, it became a pretty personal thing for me when I found that out. My, his father is not, is, not allowed, is not allowed to see it anymore. I'm sure he would like to have seen it too, but uh, my dad kind of took a personal interest in it as well. So we were, we were kind of all involved early on before, the, uh, before all the paint and all the brass, all the, uh, all the dirty work all started with my dad and I and a couple of other people. I think for me personally, it's just seeing the, she the theater uh, glow and shine as it did at the beginning. And I'm uh, a lover of tradition and history and this is a symbol to me of, of glorious good times and it's just restoring it and making it perfect for today's generation so they can learn to appreciate as others have done. started this business in 1947, so uh, a lot of things I do here are, are personal, but to, to work in this building is, is a little bit unique, but to be able to work on this fixture is, is really personal. It was, uh, uh, when, when we took the fixture back up officially, when all the glass was said and done, that was a, that was a pretty, pretty important moment for me. We don't feel like we own anything here. Everything here we just hold in trust. Uh, for future generations and this theater uh, not only is a part of that but this chandelier is a very special part of it too. Mm -hmm. 